for the last 20 years, I've been going to this little known part of India called the Nicobar Islands, which uh, most of you have only unfortunately heard about after the uh, 2004 tsunami. And uh, I want to go, I want to share some of the, my memories of these islands with you and show you what happened after the tsunami and this little project we got together to try and help people after the tsunami and where the roadblocks to that project are in terms of governance. So, sorry, I'm technologically. Uh, Okay, okay. Okay. It's uh, the uh, Nicobars are an island group which is just off the coast of Indonesia. Uh, you hear about the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, but there are actually two completely different sets of islands. The Nicobars, Great Nicobar Island that you see there is uh, just 150 uh, kilometers from Sumatra. 150 kilometers from Aceh where the uh, tsunami started. So obviously uh, it got very badly hit. As you approach Khan Nicobar, this is what you first see. In the distance, this island group comes closer and closer and closer with the lighthouse at Moose at the extreme end. And in the days when I first went there, there was no jetty. So these Racing canoes would come up, these 18 meter long canoes would come up, tether to the boat, and there used to be a swell about five feet. You had to time yourself exactly right to get into the boat. People would drop all their bags in the water. The first time I saw a truck battery go in, then I saw two in one fall in. I've seen people fall in. And then you have about 200 Nicobaris lined up in the boat, and every time something bad happens, they all go, ooh. Now, try 200 of you start trying to say ooh at the same time and see what happens. So, 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 anyway, the first thing that happened when they built the jetty is erosion. And you see the, uh, this is what the Nicobars is all about. It's one massive coconut plantation. And this is what people spend a lot of their time doing. Some lagoons, some uh, more coconuts, coconuts on the beach, coconuts inland. This is the only, the islands were occupied by the Japanese during the Second World War. This is the only uh, trace left of Japanese occupation now. Uh, badly rusted cannons all over the place. This is a typical Nicobari round hut. An entire clan lives in the upper part of that hut. And uh, most of them got washed away during the tsunami. This is one of the few left inland. A Nicobari festival. They take a pig, they rub it with coconut oil, they let it loose, and all the village youth then chase it. And whoever manages to catch this pig gets a prize. And then, of course, the pig is barbecued. Another traditional dance on the beach. Uh, boys wrestling, another big sport there. The idea is to try and knock your opponent down so that his back touches the sand the crowd watching. It's got very high literacy, almost 100% literacy. What you cannot see is that the lady standing at the back has got a little stick with which she's herding the kids. OK. Uh, you can see, look at the coastline of the island. This five meter high wave came and basically went almost over the island. The highest point of the island is uh, 10 meters. 
Now, according to the official estimates, there were 300 people dead and 3,000 missing. Unofficially, talking to the village captains, there were more like 7,000 dead. The reason why these uh, death tolls were totally underreported, I leave to your imagination. I don't want to get into that now. This is the circuit house where we all used to stay in uh, Karl Nicobar. Uh, everyone on the ground floor died, everyone on the first floor lived. So you can see exactly how high the wave was. It was five meters high. The coconut plantations also became thinner. The island lost about 20% of its coconuts, trees. But at the same time, that salt water increased the yield of the coconuts by about 20%. So there was no real net loss in the number of coconuts produced. You had this coral rubble all over the beaches. Okay, now relief operations. Uh, one day I was at the jetty in Khan Nicobar, and this uh, box with UNICEF, urgent tsunami relief supplies, box was offloaded off the ship, and it spattered its contents on the jetty, guess what came out of the box? Very vital urgent tsunami relief supplies. Uh, and this was the case with most tsunami relief there. The cash component of it never passed Port Blair because it was Andaman and Nicobar's. Every businessman in Port Blair became a project officer for ActionAid and UNICEF. And they're all building multi crore houses now. The kind part did reach the Nicobars, where it is being sold outside the Deputy Commissioner's office. You can buy a plastic bucket there, which was sent as relief material for about 600 rupees. So we felt the need that, you know, is there some small intervention we can do which. Uh, uh, you know, really enhances the livelihoods of people. And uh, the traditional trade from the Nicobars is uh, copra. They don't bother climbing the trees. They just let the ripe coconuts fall down from the trees. They extract the kernel from inside, let it literally rot in the sun for three months. And then it's shipped to Port Blair. And uh, then it's milled and you get the smelly yellow oil, which you know and cherish as parachute. Uh, but for their own houses, they produce what is called virgin coconut oil, which is the women will uh, grind the coconut as soon as it falls, uh, grate it, and then wet it in a cloth and squeeze it, and then they let the oil and water separate. Now the oil that comes from that is got no smell at all, is absolutely crystal clear, it looks like water, and has all these supposedly healthy things in it, like omega-3 fatty acids or whatever that means. I have no idea what it means, but it's supposed to be very healthy for you. And uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, health food fanatics love it. So ordinary coconut oil wholesales for sort of say 70 rupees a liter, this thing wholesales for 300 rupees a liter. So we thought, is there a way of instead of producing this smelly bad oil, can we get them to start producing virgin coconut oil? And if we can do that, then that will enhance the income very considerably. Okay. So as you see, they, their coconut planting methods are completely different from what the agricultural universities say. The trees are all planted very close together. There's a, they never clean the undergrowth. They let all of it rot and go in as organic matter to the coconuts. And funny, funny, they get a coconut yield per acre, which is far higher than any agriculture university has ever managed to do. Now, this is traditionally coconut grating. They take a piece of cane, and they rub the kernel of the coconut against it. And uh, this, is, this is how they prepare their own virgin coconut oil. So basically, 
with this, uh, we had all these, I had a consultant who had these FAO manuals with him, fat manuals, and he was going through them, how to make this virgin coconut oil. And this 70-year-old woman walks up to him, takes the manual, throws it on the ground, and says, don't teach me how to make coconut oil. We've been making it for generations. So all they do is they, uh, when they squeeze the cloth, they, they put the grated coconut in a cloth, they uh, squeeze it, and then just put it aside for 24 hours. They scoop aside the foam on top and scoop out the oil, which is the next layer, leaving the water at the bottom. And then it's milky, and that's because of the water vapor content. And if you just keep it in the sun for half an hour, the milkiness disappears. So that's, so this is the change we really wanted. And how did this change happen? I was asked to take a bunch of travel journalists to the Nicobar sometime in early 2004. One of them was this gentleman called Paul Deegan, who's a mountaineer. And after the tsunami, he uh, sent me a check for 600 pounds, saying, do something for the tsunami victims with this. And with that, we developed the first prototype coconut press. Because we had to have an efficient way of extracting the maximum oil out of this grated coconut. The traditional squeezing in a cloth would only do uh, 30%. The first model press had a screw type. The force was about less than a ton. OK, you got some oil out of it. It was not satisfactory at all. The next iteration was something far bigger, huge, weighed 350 kilos. Uh, and at this point, the tribal captains, the uh, tribal council came and said, ah, this is virgin coconut oil. This is a women's project. Don't involve us. Just involve the women. Fantastic. DST loved it. Uh, I asked for funding. To all the big agencies, everyone said, no, DST liked it because it had gender, it had tribals, it had sustainable development, it had islands, it had everything. So, so, so and you see what a problem it was unloading these uh, presses. It needed a, half the village to try and get it off the ship. So then we went for something smaller. This is version 3. The problem with version 3 is it had a design fault, that crossbar you see. And the day we offloaded it, somebody ran up to it and started pumping the hydraulic jack without having put anything in it. So that crossbar snapped. Version 4. OK, we said, OK, let's, let's put a flat plate. Let's dispense with a cylinder. Let's put a flat plate, except that all the coconut used to leak from the side, and it wouldn't get pressed at all. Finally, we came up with the last design, which is just a, a hydraulic jack, one of these cheap Chinese jacks available in the market, fitted to a cylinder. And there's handles at the end, which we can use to tilt the whole apparatus vertical, fill it with the coconut, close the flap at the end, and then start pumping. OK, the other innovation we tried was introducing electric graters. And uh, they were not happy with the electric graters, because traditionally, when women grate coconuts, they like to gossip with each other. And if you have an electric grater which goes, wee, you can't really gossip. So. Uh, that was abandoned. So these were the final specifications of what we did. And then, OK, I found this youth group, which had uh, about uh, two representatives from each of the 15 villages who'd all been to the Tata Institute of Social Sciences for uh, uh, months training in sustainable development. They were uh, uh, 
something like 25 women and 5 men. And that's the group I've been working with ever since. Here they're preparing a fresh batch of coconut oil. This is a seminar we had. And yeah, they suddenly turned out in uniforms one day with headbands, face masks. And I said, how did this happen? Oh, we saw this in National Geographic. So we're also doing this. So this is the finished product, the coconut oil. And uh, uh, just a couple more shots. Now the economics of it, you can see that from ordinary copra, one coconut costs rupees, oh, this font didn't come properly. Uh, one coconut is four rupees. And if you make virgin coconut oil, one coconut is almost 10 rupees. That's a gain of six rupees per coconut. Now, this youth group, I will just leave you with a final thought. This youth group applied for registration uh, 10 months ago. For the last 10 months, those papers have been lying on top of the deputy commissioner's office. That is a loss to poor tribal people of something like a minimum of 8 lakh rupees. Now, what kind of system do we have where one bureaucrat can hold an entire island to hostage because of some politically connected trader whose uh, copra business might get affected? I'll leave you with that thought.